Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. I don't know who's here. Nobody's here? Oh, Kristen's here. Kristen. Yeah, we're trying hey, to make Jeff. it. Hey, so he just texted me that he's gonna be a little bit late. I'm gonna say. Okay. Um. So he. So so just to give you like a one liner about him. He's um, he's a private doc. Okay. He's been obesity. He's obesity medicine certified. He has some uh, mm -hmm. experience with genetics. He's like a yeah, entrepreneur. Also, is a very much an entrepreneur. Uh, he's been a mentor of mine for a long time. Um, okay. And. Uh, and the other thing is, is he was huge with the COVID response. As a private uh -huh. doctor, you know, he was able to get up like five or 10 testing sites before hospitals were up. Oh, and wow. So, yeah, exactly. So I want to talk to him about, you know, one, just like the troubles of like the problems of being a doctor in the system. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to him about um, uh, the, you know, like how, um, because he, I know he's had some hardship dealing with like big medical systems, and maybe you can like give your points too about that along the way, and I can give okay. my points about that along the way. And he kind yeah. of rose above those, and ultimately became like an uh, an entrepreneur, and then he was able to leverage that by responding quicker than hospitals. You know, cool. So, yeah, so yeah. I think that I mean, I, I mean, I we'll go with whatever he wants, but I'm gonna bring him in now. Cool. Sounds good. Okay. Dr. Murphy. Wow. It's going to be from your car. Holy crap. Where are you? Oh my God. I'm busy. I'm in Greenwich right now. Um, okay. Right outside of one of our testing sites. What's do you have, on, do you have an hour? Do you have an hour? Yeah. Or no? yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is, so, so this is, uh, uh, Dr. Kristen Bayer. Were we all first Hi. name here? Can we do first names? Yes, it's please. easier. Please, <laughs> okay. Please. All right. So uh, this is my idea for this, and I'm going to let you – obviously, we're going to let you talk a lot. Okay, but, you know, one of the themes we all have in common is rising above the medical system to become physician entrepreneurs in private practice, okay, and how that was able to leverage you to respond quicker than hospital systems to COVID, okay? Because oh, how many okay. testing sites do you have now? 11. 11 testing sites up, right? And I, wow. you got your testing sites up and you, you know, before any hospital system in the New York, in the, you know, New York area that yep. I'm aware of before the States. So, and how many tests are you running a day now? Um, we are now well over a thousand tests a day ourselves. A thousand tests a day, right? So, so yep. what I wanted to, I mean, I, look, we're going to let you talk about how you got into obesity medicine and how you got into entrepreneurship and private practice. I would love it if you shared that. You don't have to. I know it's like like picking an old scab. Yep, Steve. I got it though. It's Put it on okay. Do Not Disturb. Put it on Do Not Disturb. I'm, I'm trying, brother. Everything yeah. keeps popping. They keep bugging me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put All it on right. Do Not Disturb, okay? Got it. On it. All right. So yeah. uh, you're okay with that line of – Yep. I mean, we'll let you go. Wherever, where, is there anything you yeah, wanted to yeah. cover? I asked you about your genetic um, counseling background. I think it would be interesting, mm -hmm. like, if you ever do, like, obesity testing um, with the genetics, like, for MC4R deficiency, yeah, or do, sure. do you not do anything stuff. about that? Yeah. So, yeah, we do, I, I don't do melanocortin receptor. Oh, wow, this light is horrible here. Um, <laughs> I, I don't do melanocortin receptor stuff, to be honest with you, because 
that two reasons. One is the labs that test for it, a lot of times it's not reimbursed. So then the patient ends up uh, stuck with a bill. Okay. That's number one. And number two is um, when I do, a as a geneticist, right, I do family history. So when I look at family history of obesity, I, I can almost bet that if I test, that's going to be an MCR, uh, a melanocortin receptor family positive. Right, so yeah. it just it, yeah. it runs insanely strong. No, there's other ones, right? There's well, let's, well, hold on. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Can we talk about it on the podcast? All right, let's yeah. talk about it on the podcast. Sorry, we're gonna do it all on the podcast. Okay. <laughs> so let's not. I'm so excited to pick your brain. <laughs> oh crap! We're already recording. Hold on, I gotta stop this and then re-record it. Okay. Well, here we go. All right, guys, and welcome back to the Low Carb MD podcast. We have a real special treat. Well, first of all. I am very, very lucky to have a new co-host today, uh, somebody to replace that old guy, uh, Brian Lenskis. <laughs> you know, he, I think he's out um, watching Matlock or I don't know what he's doing, something like that. So we have the pleasure <laughs> of having Dr. Kristen Bayer, his partner, um, fill in, and uh, we'll be seeing a lot more of her on the podcast too, which is going to be great. And we have a really special guest. Well, before I introduce him, Kristen, how are you doing? Good, good. Thanks. Yeah, Brian and I just uh, launched our clinic this week. So it's been crazy, but things are good. We're keeping Brian busy assembling furniture over there right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a really special guest today, somebody who means a lot to me. Um, uh, personally, been a mentor to me for a very long time. And he's doing amazing things. He's been doing amazing things for a long time. And the hardships he went through to do those amazing things but where he's come on the opposite side, I think is, is really outstanding. His name is Dr. Stephen Murphy, okay? And he uh, did his training uh, at Greenwich Hospital, the same hospital I did my training at in the Yale system. He also has, uh, he was a, a fellow in uh, genetics uh, over at Yale, and he's also obesity medicine certified. In fact, he's the one who pushed me initially to get my obesity medicine certification. And... Uh, besides being a, somebody who's you know, focused on the genetic causes of metabolic disease and outside factors and somebody who's uh, instilled in me a passion for metabolic health, he's also one of the most interesting entrepreneurs, physician entrepreneurs I've met and somebody who's really helped me become independent, right? And been independent and so that he doesn't have to rely on big hospital systems and rely on uh, to tell me how to practice medicine so I can care for my patients. And the most amazing thing recently, the exemplification of all of his hard work, I thought was best exemplified when recently during this COVID outbreak, he opened up 11 testing sites. And many of those testing sites were open before any hospital system was open. He was, and I, you know, you may have seen pictures on social media when I visited a testing site, that was his sites. And he was doing testing, wearing, advocating mask wearing, before anybody else was. So Dr. Stephen Murphy, very, very happy and a pleasure to have you on here. I hope you know how much you mean to me as a person, as a friend, and I'm very happy to have you here. Tro, I, I couldn't say no. You're like, um, <laughs> you're like my brother, man. How, how, could I, how could I not? I, I'm so proud of what you've done, what you've put together. And it, it's one of those things as a teacher, you... Um, your students teach you and um tro you've taught me quite a few things and so i, I want to thank you for having me on the show all right so let's let's get to it so one of the things all of us have in common uh Kristen, myself and you uh steven is that um we've all had to deal with some hardships from uh big medical systems and and we kind of had to rise above that to become solo private practice uh, physicians and honestly f for probably delivering better care as uh, independent physicians than as part of the the system so if you if you mind if and you don't have to do you want to talk about kind of how you got to being in private practice and how you disconnected from you know the beasts so to speak <laughs> yeah you know i um i've always been an entrepreneurial physician even when i was a clinical fellow in genetics up at Yale, I was helping a couple of doctors run their own practice in Manhattan. And so I would 
do my fellowship during the day. And at night times, I would drive down to Manhattan from New Haven and help them get their, their practice optimized. And I was, because um, I had a license, I was a partner in their practice, even though I hadn't finished a training. And I got great pushback from that, right? The, you know, even though it's a completely different zone of influence, right? Yale versus Manhattan, the Yale um, group uh, leaned on me, said, what are you doing in your free time? Well, I, I'm, I'm helping these other doctors out. Well, you can't help these other doctors out. And so we had some challenges there, that's for sure. But I've, I've, um, <laughs> there are so many more, I, I don't want to bore no, you. No, no, no. If you yeah, want to go the, into them, the we want to go ones. into them because the story of your hardship is very meaningful. Because I think, especially now, we know where that's resulted in somebody who is able yeah, to sure. mobilize much quicker than hospital systems. So if you want to share it, you know, I'm happy to, we're happy to hear that. You know, I think one of the big things, I think one of the keys with all of this is having a righteous purpose and, and being confident in that, you know, being confident in your righteous purpose. And as an entrepreneur, that's what has to drive you. Because if you don't believe in what you're doing, the, the challenges, the people that will say no, the people that will say you could never do that in a private practice, the people that will say you're charging too much for your services, they're not, they're not worth what you're providing, um, these are hard, right? Um, you know, when we first started with My Righteous Purpose, you, you have to fund um, your dream. And so I had... Um, borrowed some money from our local hospital system. And um, with that money comes strings, right? I, I, a bank, when you borrow money, is not going to shut you down if you compete with them, right? It's, it's not going to do that. I mean, maybe if you're a bank. Um, the problem in healthcare is if you borrow money from a hospital, they're going to want to have a say on what you do, just as if you're an employed physician. And so after a few months in the practice, we had some trouble making ends meet because it takes years to build a practice. It takes years to build a practice. And so we invited a cardiologist from a neighboring health system to come and share our space to offset on some of the rent costs, which uniquely the hospital had loaned me the money, was also renting me space to get their money back in a space that was unoccupied previously, right? So <laughs> they knew what they were doing. They hustled me pretty good. And um, so they gave you money and they said, come, not only will we give you money, you can give us back in overpriced rent. And on top of that, yeah. <laughs> we're not going to let you manage. We're not going to let you practice medicine the way you want. Correct. Correct. And what and happened, what happened next? Oh, what I'm going to tell you. So when they found out that I brought the competing cardiologist over, they illegally locked me out of my office. Oh, man. They, <laughs> they changed the locks. They changed the locks. I went down to Texas for an unrelated issue. I came back, tried to get into my office to see a patient on a Saturday. Why? Because you're an entrepreneur. You're hustling. You say, yes, I'll see patients on Saturdays. And um, the lock had changed. So I call security. I said, oh, you know, maybe there's a mistake here. Um, this lock has changed. And they said, oh, no, well, we'll send security over. Security came over and I said, listen, you, you guys, you're locking me out of the office. I've got patients I have to see. Oh, I'll call, let me call the CEO. Meanwhile, I'm seeing patients in the parking lot looking at rashes and checking vital six, seven doctor's bag in my, the, my car. So I've got an office in a car. So I'm, I'm checking vital signs and making sure these patients are okay in the parking lot while I wait for the head of security to come back. Well, the head of security calls me on my phone and says, I spoke to Mr. Corvino. Indeed, your office is locked. We did change <laughs> your locks. It's pretty bold of them, right? And you're not getting in until you have a meeting with Mr. Corvino. Uh, okay. Wow. So, um, wow. Yeah, so it's pretty heavy. But an entrepreneur never ceases to learn new things. So I pop in my phone, and this was 2000 and what, nine maybe? 2000, yeah, nine. Um, I Google in my phone, Connecticut lockouts. It turns out what they did was completely illegal. 
I, sh- I should have called the cops because the lockout handbook says one, determine that the tenant is the tenant, right? Two, call the landlord, tell him to let the tenant in. Three, if the landlord refuses, get a warrant of arrest for the landlord. Have a nice day. That's how Connecticut works. <laughs> and so as I was bathing my child, the dual, you know, dual purposing is and entrepreneurs, we're always doing five things at once, trying to gain time back. Um, I text them the handbook. I should have just called the cops, but I texted the handbook and I said, am I going to have to call the cops? Which speaks again, I think, to physicians, right? We're just trying to get along, right? We're not trying to scale a series of advantages where we take advantage of people. I think as physicians, we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to do the right thing. And so, of course, they backpedaled and and gave me all of my stuff and let me out of my lease. But boy, Tro, that was the first experience of hard knocks that I got from a hospital system. It didn't end there, but yeah. So, uh, well, it's interesting because um, I know that the hardship has actually continued uh, personally because now, you know, um, you know, I, as a resident, when I was a resident, I did a rotation with you because I and there's a business in medicine rotation. Um, and because I have no idea how to run a business and I was like, you know what, I, maybe down the line I can go into private practice. They don't really teach you. They don't even teach you about coding in residency, no. like how to code for these insurers. Not that, in fact, I, I think it's a terrible that we even have to think about it this way, but this is the insurance system we're in. And I was like, let me go talk to this guy. You know, it seems like he knows what he's doing. Let me go spend a month with him. And it was the most important months of my life because I really learned how to run a private practice. And now I've learned how to practice completely independently. And here we are, Kristen and Brian, you know, I'm passing that along to them and, and helping them get up, set up completely independently. So, so just to show you, Stephen, the impact of your knowledge. But I know that that same hospital system, um, you know, they won't let you take residence anymore in this type of elective. They so shut know, it down. They I know shut that it down, the, I know that the, um, the hardship has continued. So, so I want to pivot a little bit because um, let's fast forward, you know, to now the COVID outbreak and we're going to come back to genetics and obesity. I know Kristen's got a ton of questions on that. And we were just talking about it before, we got, uh, right before yeah. we got on. So we're going to come to that guys. We're going to talk about, but you know, this COVID pandemic that's been going on, um, you, you have 11 sites up and running right now doing more than a thousand tests a day. Okay. And, and tell me if I'm wrong, were you up and running before major hospital systems or after? We were ahead of everyone, Tro. We started testing on March 9th. When was your first test? March 9th. March, March 9th, right? Right. We were, we were on it March 9th. And And the only other place was testing was sending it off to the state lab and waiting 10 days. In fact, I just want to let you know, we were trying to use your expertise to get a testing site up near our practice, and we were working with our local Department of Health. And had I had, you know, kind of the years of entrepreneurial experience that, that you have, I probably, and it was maybe a year or two further in my career, I probably could have done it, you know, uh, with your help just as quickly as I could have. But we were actually in talks with getting our site up before the Department of Health with your help in our county. So I, I, I want to talk about that because do you feel like that independence, that financial independence, what, you know, that uh, being a little bit separate, being a little maverick, do you think that that had a part to play in the fact that you're probably one of the biggest testers and the earliest testers in the area? Oh, for sure. You know, we saw, and this is important as an entrepreneur, and also the, there's a reason why um, entrepreneurial physicians are a, considered a little maverick. They see patterns quicker than anyone else does. They, they are ahead of the patterns. They say if applesauce and peanut butter and the letter 23, right, letter 23, right, they take disparate pieces of information and they say, if I put all of this together, you're going to get, you know, in five years, the following outcome. And I, I think that that's probably helps us with the weight loss side too, right? If it if you're if, if MCR you can, for you know, yeah, and you have a or, family history of you know, yeah. uh, obesity or if you're and, eating you know. bread and butter, 
right? And you right. tell someone it's bread and butter, you shouldn't eat bread and butter. And they're not going to listen. You say, but what if I say that bread is carbs and butter is fat? What else is carbs and fat? That's ice cream, right? So anything that's a carb and fat together, is technically an ice cream, right? So we have to be able to coach patients. And in this case, we had to be able to coach local towns. We had to tell them, listen, two weeks from now, you are going to have hospitals that are overrun. Why? Well, let's think about this. This is a virus that drops your oxygen saturation. And when you only have, you know, a uh, 100-bed hospital, a 200-bed hospital, and you have 20 ICU beds or 40 ICU beds, how big is your population, Mayor? 140,000 people. Okay, so how many of them need to be infected badly to overrun your ICU? Oh, my God! that's when it clicks, right? When you can describe to them how easily it can happen. And, oh no, I put it on do not disturb, Tro, and I still got disturbed. <laughs> um, right. Anyways, so maybe I'll turn on, oh, I can't do airplane mode because I'm not on Wi-Fi. Anyways, so being able to push forward, being able to talk to the mayor with a set of knowledge that they didn't have and be able to give them the opportunity to learn more was a se- oh it happened again to learn more was essential that was the key yeah so and and walk me through what so you started wearing masks in the hospital before oh. uh before everybody else was and you were testing uh i think when you see how many are positive and you're just, you know, you're the positivity rate coming so high and you're doing these private tests before the hospitals are, you're like, I don't want to get this. So you're oh, wearing bro. a mask in the hospital system and what happened? So it wasn't just a mask, Tro. I, I washed my hair in the hand shower. Um, I, so I had asked, ooh, because I was testing in the field and I had a positive COVID patient in the hospital, probably one of the first. And I knew the contagiousness of this and we wore Tyvek suits in the field. We wore, um, we wore Tyvek suits. We had hair, hair protection. We had, you, know, you saw the helmets, the face shields that we had. We, we had proper PPE on. Before, uh, proper, uh, before hospital before, systems. Before, before anyone anybody. did. Yep. We had proper uh, protective equipment on. So I went in with my N95 on and I got scolded by a nurse supervisor. Dr. Murphy, you can't wear your N95 in the hall. I, I'm sorry. Well, Dr. Murphy, what, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm taking care of my COVID positive patient. In fact, why aren't any of your people wearing headgear? Why aren't any of your people in masks right now? Like, what are you doing? Well, um, you know, we don't need that. And you're just being very reactionary. You are, you're scaring the nurses. You're scaring the nurses. You're creating a disruptive situation. Again, it goes back to a righteous purpose, Tro. My yeah. job was to prevent COVID, even in the nursing staff, who, by the way, a bunch of them ended up sick with it anyways. Um, but I got scolded for wearing an N95, and they refused to give me a, a surgical cap to protect my hair. Now, this patient was coughing like crazy. I didn't have my face shield. They didn't have any of it. And, and, but I persisted. And now when I go into that same hospital, Everyone's in a mask. Everyone has a surgical cap on and no one is coming to me and saying, and there's an important part as an entrepreneur, no one's going to come to you and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Yeah. Don't ever no, expect that. No, never happens. <laughs> that, don't ever expect that. It's never going to happen. Ever. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I tell my patients the same thing. If you're doing fasting, if you're doing low carb, don't expect anybody to come and give you a pat on the back because in fact, they're going to even, they're going to make it hard. They just have a little bit. Have a little bit, or they're gonna say, you know what, you know, fast, like just, just eat, just eat. Why don't, why are you not eating? It's like, well, right. because I'm overweight and I want to lose weight, right? Like that's why I'm not eating, right? But you know, it's always gonna be somebody actually making it harder for you, even if you're doing the right thing. And I, that's one thing about your story that I've seen. Even when you're trying to just be an independent doctor, you've had it made hard for you time and time again, and yet here you are opening up 11 testing sites, testing a thousand people, wearing masks in the hospital before everybody. 
um, and doing, you know, doing the right thing. So I, I, I think that your story is such a testament to, you know, uh, enduring hardship, but when you have a clear vision, you know how to kind of walk out of it on, you know, on the other end, learn from your mistakes, adapt, be better. Um, and look, I mean, you're the, probably one of the biggest testers in the, in the kind of the, uh, probably the biggest private tester in the New York, New Jersey, you know, uh, area. So I want to segue a little bit because we talk about intermittent fasting and, um, and uh, uh, low carb approaches. You're also obesity medicine certified. You also have a genetics background. So I know Kristen had some questions specifically about some of that. So Kristen, take the, take it over. Yeah. Oh, Stephen, first, can you tell us your background about how you um, obtained a certification in obesity medicine? Did you have a personal story that kind of led you down sure. that path or felt there was a need that wasn't being addressed? Absolutely. So as a lot of entrepreneurs do, they work very hard and they don't take care of themselves. And um, as another reason, that's a teaching point with Tro, right? And just in awe, right? Um, I gained weight. I gain weight. And now luckily I'm blessed. I'm blessed with being an athlete in college and in high school. So I, I can get in shape quickly and I have a pretty good internal um, sort of physiology, right? I can uh, take a, a, a beating. And so I, I checked my blood pressure because I had a headache and it was 140 over 92 which my normal blood pressure is 110. And even now it's just the 110s, heart rates in the 50s and uh, sometimes 60s. So I said to, um, I said to my nurse, I said, I, I, I've got to fix this. I've got to figure it out. And so I went to a gym because that's where you go to lose weight, right? You go to the gym to lose weight, right? Oh, yeah. Wrong. Exercise <laughs> right. more, eat less, <laughs> right? Right, wrong, wrong, wrong. And, um, and they put me on this machine, which was actually a basal metabolic rate machine, which was by a company called New Leaf. And they said, these are the calories you need to eat if you want to lose weight. That was number one that they said. Then number two, they said is, this is the heart rate that you need to be in if you want to burn fat as fuel at a heart rate. It was remarkably low. It was like 102. Now, I didn't know this science from anything, right? I'm a board certified internist. And at the time, I wasn't a board certified bariatrician, but I was also a trained geneticist. And so I understand physiology, pathophysiology. I'd been teaching a little bit of it at the medical school at the time. And so I, I, I followed the instructions. I started to lose weight. Frankly, I think it's because in order to eat that many calories, I could only eat two meals a day rather than three. So I actually intermittent <laughs> fasted without knowing it. Um, and so then I hooked everyone up to this machine. They had emotional buy-in and started doing intermittent fasting too. And uh, well, what do you mean? If I only have 800 or 1,000 calories to eat, what would have one great meal a day, right? And yeah. so we were teaching that while I also was um, learning about insulin in metabolism, just as a curiosity. As I started to learn those two things, it drew me in biochemically to metabolism, which naturally caused me to focus a little bit more and lose a little bit more weight. And as I did that, and I started Googling, I came across one of these companies that you can pay thousands of dollars for, and they'll sell you CME to get certified in bariatric medicine. And I said, well, this is great. This is, I'm really interested in this, but as the entrepreneur in me says, there's gotta be another way. There's gotta be a cheaper way. There's got, and I'm paying them a licensing fee? No, no, what are they doing for me, right? And that's what the entrepreneur I think sees, right? And, the, and, and everything in my mind is a very entrepreneurial thing. Even the, the passion to say, wow, I lost weight. My blood pressure got back to normal. I need to give this to other people. How can I do that with, with good credentialing? And so that led me, I, gosh, I think it's been nine years now, right? I've been certified since 2011 or 12. Um, before, I think a big uptake of, of everyone ones. else recognized it. Yeah, you got it. You got it. So I, 
again, like the COVID test. I see where you're going, troll. I see it, <laughs> right? I, I never re reflectively looked at these things, but yeah. So it, I jumped on it at that time. I was very happy to do it. Yeah, and I, to this day, some of the most valuable learning I had w was in obesity medicine. So let, let, yeah. let, before we go tackle genetics, let's talk about metabolic health and COVID. So what are your, you know, maybe you're seeing a lot of COVID, uh, you deal with a lot of metabolic health, you use intermittent fasting as a tool, you use kind of paleo, real food, low carb approaches. You got it. Have you noticed anything? Can you tell us a little bit about COVID oh, and sure. metabolic health? You know, it's funny for those, for the untrained eye, um, you will say that COVID is a diabetic disease. And if you have diabetes, you die from COVID. But if you're metabolically inclined, you say this is likely an adipocyte problem that is leading to a pro-inflammatory condition that also is affecting your, your insulin receptivity, right? We're seeing that people's hemoglobin A1Cs are going up with this disease. We're seeing baseline sugars go up with this disease. To the untrained eye, you go, oh, that's out of control diabetes. To the trained eye, you say, that's inflammation, that's adipokines, that is resistant being secreted from the fat cells, that right, like all of these things are playing a role here in COVID, right? And so it is remarkable to see worsening insulin resistance in COVID. It's remarkable to see this endothelial dysfunction in COVID because it's truly bringing together all of these metabolic aspects of this diabetes epidemic that we have um, together. It, it really is, it's pushing right on America's weak spots in healthcare. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Stephen, with um, the, your, your patients that you're testing for COVID now, what percent would you say has severe complications um, based on like a healthy, metabolically healthy patient versus someone who does have diabetes? Are you seeing any healthy people have severe complications? Yes. Yeah, so we, it's, it's an interesting break here, right? I, I'll take the big global picture first. 10 to 15% of people have complications, for sure. 10 to 15% are getting complications, maybe even as high as 20%, right? So people may not think it's a big deal, but that's one in five people, right? So in a million people, that's a lot of people with complications. Now, we don't know long-term complications because we haven't had long-term to tell. There could be a lot of post-infectious changes that linger. I still have patients that were positive in March that are still having problems to this day. Small percentage, right? But we saw 10 to 15% of people had problems. When you start to add on things like obesity, when you add on things like insulin resistance, people who are headed into this, who had a fasting insulin of 18 beforehand, they are much higher complication rate. The, those patients I'm seeing are probably between 30 to 40% of them long-term sequela in terms of three or four or five months sequela, right? And mm -hmm. so being obese, having insulin resistance, these are, are, are bad things as a whole, right? We know they increase your risk of heart attacks and strokes and everything else, but, and cancers, but they're also a big risk for COVID sequela, COVID complications for sure. Right. So one question we get a lot on social media is you have someone who maybe does have diabetes right now, who does have uh, extra weight to lose, and they understand the importance of metabolic health during the time of COVID, and they're a little discouraged, like, I can't lose 50 pounds, you know, in the next couple months. And we, we kind of remind them that metabolic changes happen much more quickly than the weight might be coming off. So what would you advise your patients who maybe do have some metabolic risk factors right now, what can they start doing today to protect themselves from the severe course of, of a COVID infection? Intermittent fasting, right? Macro, macro caloric changes, right? Macronutrient changes, shifting mm -hmm. themselves to a less inflammatory diet. That means a diet that's not going to spike insulin levels, right? A diet that's not going to trigger inflammatory molecules, right? Believe it or not, things like, and this is where my 
my juice business, Tro, and my organic food business comes into here. We know a lot of um, vegan diets that are actually very pro-inflammatory, right? So if you're going to have a vegan diet, you need to make sure it's a non-inflammatory vegan diet. Stay away from corn. Stay away from nightshades like eggplants and, and tomatoes, right? It's just stay away from legumes. Get away from the things that are going to get your body inflamed if you want to do it a vegan way. Um, not everyone uh, purports to say that vegan is the best way. And I am a, uh, I'm an omnivore, right? So I'm, I, but I have put patients on carnivore diets and we've seen tremendous reductions in inflammation in people on carnivore diets, right? And with properly sourced meats, right? We're not saying, uh, and, and you could, I mean, theoretically, you'd take the, like Eric Westfall or one of these other guys will say, yeah, I have patients in the Carolinas that'll go to McDonald's and get their, their burger patties and just eat them all day long. Um, I'm not saying to do that, right? I'm, I, I like to try and source your carnivore diet a little bit healthier than that. But I can tell you one thing right now, um, impossible burgers and those sorts of things are the last thing I would honestly want in my diet because they have a lot of pro-inflammatory um, uh, veg uh, vegetables in them. They are pro-inflammatory plants in that little patty. And I'm here to tell you right now, the long-term sequela of the, the pseudo meat, as long as they use these pro-inflammatory uh, plants, that's, that's going to be a problem. It'll be a real problem. Are there any genetic tidbits? Because you can combine kind of metabolic health and genetics and genetic totally. evaluations. You know, do you have any insights kind of about the genetic, uh, uh, you know, how does somebody with genetics of a background approach uh, obesity and, you know, in our modern world, do you think genetics are running the show here, running obesity, or do you think it's more of a uh, metabolic health issue or, you know, just help us, give us some insight about that. So one of my good friends and a teacher of yours and mine by the name of John Sitaro, um, had a great quote that he just came up with on his own. There are just some people like this, Tro, that their words go to paper so eloquently and, and it just rings true. And John Satara is one of those guys. And he said, there is no genetic defect that cannot be overcome with aggressive environmental modification. Further, there is no genetic advantage that not, cannot be squandered with aggressive environmental modification, right? So um, th there are those who are gifted amongst us who have less inflammation, who have more dense muscle mass, who are more able to express um, uh, uh, GLUT4 receptors, who are able to properly handle um, carbohydrate loads without this insulin resistant pattern. But those two can be easily overcome, Tro. It can be easily overcome with aggressive, bad environmental modification. And okay. we see it all the time. Are there any, so, uh, yes. are there any genetic tests you focus on or, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, particular syndromes that you've seen? Um, you know, sure. anything, any kind of genetic tidbits that you have? So I, I think the first genetic tidbit is the cheapest genetic test that's out there, right? It's called the family history. Right. And, and right, that's, that's number one, right? You should get a real family history of understanding what's going on, looking for things like autosomal dominant issues, which pass between the generations. Um, these are like the MC4R, like the melanocortin receptor mutations, right? These tend to run in families as well. We see a younger onset of obesity with this, right? We see a younger onset of obesity with this. And that requires pretty aggressive modification of diet. We know that there are a couple of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that come with satiety, right? That come with sensation of satiety. But Tro, I don't have that one. I don't have that one. Let me tell you, I got a yeah. I don't ever get full. I, you know, yeah. I, that, I, I want to tell you, there are people like that, Tro. And we think part of that is actually imprinting. You know, a good example is this condition called Prader Willi, right? Prader Willi versus Angelman syndrome or Angelman syndrome. Prader Willi patients are ravenous. Why? Why? They have a different epigenetic pattern. They have a different methylation pattern on the exact same chromosome area 
as other patients who have Angelman syndrome, right? So there are paternal imprinting and maternal imprinting. This is where we put molecules on top of the DNA to change genetic expression with, without mutating the disease. Sorry about that. And that type of issue is very, very important. And I think what we're going to find in the next phase here is genetics does rule the day, but only through environmental modification. And so you, you look at, they did the, one of the Dutch studies did on, on a, um, they did a starvation study where they found that the generation after the famine actually had a much hardier response to build muscle mass due to epigenetic imprinting. And so what we're learning genetically about things like intermittent fasting is we're changing our epigenetic germline. And so you're actually helping your next generation through fasting, not just your own body. Yeah, I think that that's really interesting that not only is there genetic, so some of these genetic issues that Dr. Murphy's bringing up have to do with uh, uh, even genetic issues that deal with leptin hormone or other hormones and satiety signals. But what we're also talking about here is the, the interplay with our environment and our, uh, uh, the, the exposure of our maternal and paternal genes and their environment and how that affects us. This is all very fascinating stuff. Um, this is, is very cool. Is there any, anything actionable, let's say, you know, that you would do based on this stuff? So it's tough, right? Like, how do you, you know, you know I'll tell you, right. Pathway genomics has some stuff out and a lot of it actually had the dietary nutrigenomics, you know, nutrigenomics right now truly is like looking through a keyhole into a room, right? We say, um, you know, Colonel Mustard with, with, the, with the, the knife, right? But we don't know what really happens in there. We don't really know. And nutrigenomics is one of the fields I've been interested in for decades now. We, we don't really know what diet is best for what people based on your genome. You can get some ideas of how you will metabolize different medications but you can't definitively say that. So this is why it's so important to have a doctor to work back and forth with you on your diet, right? We think we may have an idea of how we treat you with what macronutrients, right? Or we just say, eat this stuff until you're full, right? And which food fills you up quickest? And which food reduces your numbers the quickest? So it's like you need that Sherpa. You, you need that um, physician that understands you and understands metabolism to work with you. And you can buy a lot of genetic stuff. And yeah, we I know see a lot of this stuff. And I, and I, I, I got to be honest, I think it's – Kristen, have you seen that stuff like eat for your blood test or, you know, oh, yeah. you know use the genetic – get a genetic diet? So what, what's your initial thought on that? Because mine is like this stuff is like such a waste of money. It, it's, you know? it's not, I hate to say clinically actionable as a word, because that's what the academic centers would use on me when I was doing something out over the ski tips and didn't have full evidence behind it. Um, but I saw the patterns and said, yeah, no, no, this is COVID, right? We're going to wear a mask, right? Hi. Um, well, where's the evidence for that? Oh, okay, guys. Okay. Um, so I don't want to um, shut it down, but from what I know genetically, most of these studies are on limited populations that do not apply to the broad swath of us, okay? Therefore, they can't be used by the broad swath of us. And, and that in and of itself is, that's my take, Kristen. Right. I, I was going to ask, so we get a lot with, I know you use ketogenic diets in your practice. People are concerned about the ApoE4 allele or ApoE2 in terms of, their metabolism of saturated fat and um, how this is going to interplay with the risk of Alzheimer's disease later on, and if they should benefit from a ketogenic diet but still have that hesitancy because they've done 23andMe or one of those online genetic mm -hmm. tests for family history and discover they have this allele. Do you have any concerns for patients so, eating a high-fat diet? 
So that, first, I've got a great history with 23andMe, right? <laughs> I actually, in 2007, took them to the woodshed when they didn't have the proper licensing um, to run a laboratory. I went crazy. Um, <laughs> and, and not that I tried to shut them down, because I thought what they wanted to do was reasonable. I just didn't think feeding it into a Google database that matched up with your Gmail account was a smart way to go. Um, <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> right? But that's okay. You know, they're doing their own thing. Here's the deal with APO4 and a, like these APO alleles. The trick, the rubber, the, where the rubber meets the road is in tracking lipid panels and inflammation. Yeah, yeah, we're doctors, right? So our job is to intervene, look for change, monitor for damage, right? Primum non nocere, first do no harm. So, okay, I understand your genetic predilection on your, 23 and me test, but let's get some where some rubber meets the road, right? Let's take a look. Let, let's look at a Cleveland heart lab or a Boston heart lab. Let's look at your inflammatory markers. Let's look at your myeloperoxidase, right? And in our office, we actually have a full vast offices, right? I, it's funny because we really haven't been operating a lot out of our offices right now. We've been in drive throughs and out in the field. Um, when we get back to offices, and currently we actually have some outside vascular imaging centers that we run. So in our offices, we look at your carotid intimal medial thickness. We look at your aorta. We look for atherosclerosis there. We look for signs of inflammation. We do it in blood work and we do it on imaging. And, and yes, maybe this may happen, but maybe it won't. But if you don't try this option, you're not going to maybe be as effective at losing the weight you need to lose which ultimately end is, is the, the righteous purpose, right? The righteous purpose is to get the adiposity off of their body, to, to get them in a healthier position. And it's a pathway to get there. And you can argue about which diet is best for which people, but if you monitor the patient with proper blood work, with proper care, you're going to do what's best regardless of what the APOE level uh, is, right? Whatever that allele is. You know, I'm you know? going gonna, gonna to jump in here because I, I can't agree more. I don't know which diet is going to work for who long term. We don't have that data. We don't know which genetic diet is yours, which blood type diet is yours. I don't know if keto is going to work for you. I don't know if whole food plant-based is going to work for you. I don't know if Mediterranean is going to work. I don't know what's going to work. I know general themes. So what do I do? I verify everything. Right, I got a lipid machine right here, an A1C machine right here, CRP machine right here. I can do a CIMT, look at your inflammation on your arteries. I send you for a calcium score. I am gonna monitor everything. And if something doesn't look good, most of the time it looks great. Sometimes we gotta, we gotta you know, there's no way I can tell you this diet's gonna work for you for life. We have to monitor, this is the whole point of having a doctor do yes. your do work with you on weight. And this is why you're not going to the guy selling a juice fast. It's because I can verify, you know, concrete markers of health along the way. So I think, look, I don't even trust myself. I'm low carb. I do intermittent fasting. I verify my own stuff. Like I put the ultrasound on my carotid. Like I don't trust myself. I do what I, I'm, look, I believe in what I do, but I don't drink my own Kool-Aid. So I, I appreciate the fact, I agree with you 100%. Even when it comes down to genetics, people coming in with FH, you know, who've lost a, a familial hypercholesterolemia, who've lost a ton of weight on ketogenic diets and their cholesterol is a little high, right? Well, let's just track. And they're like, I will never take a statin. Well, that may be all great and dandy, but we should just make sure, right? okay, that your end organs are not accumulating plaque. Right. We should just do that. Right. That's great that you, but I, you're paying me to think. So I will look and I will make sure everything that you, you know, you expect to happen will happen. And if it changes, we have to make a change. Right. And that's, that's the deal here. We have to respond to evidence we have. So I love that approach. And that's a great question, Kristen. I mean, that's an, a really excellent question. Uh, so I, I, I can't agree more. Stephen, in your practice, what do you find patients have the most success with in general? Do you feel a lot of them do well low carb or going fully ketogenic? Do you have a lot that prefer to do plant-based or what has your experience been? 
we find that ketogenic diets with intermittent fasting paired together are a very powerful solution for patients. Yeah. Very powerful solution. Yeah, you know, can I can I come back to that because you know, I've now probably dealt with ten, maybe a little bit more than ten strict vegetarian vegan patients mm-hmm. who have who have done phenomenal, phenomenal with lowering their carbs and go and doing intermittent fasting. They are on ketogenic diets, enjoying their foods, feeling great. So ketogenic, it's agnostic. I truly believe it's agnostic. Just get your carbs low enough, eat. Correct. You know, eat, you know, get you the, I mean, and we're talking about a vegan, so you can't get the carbs down to zero, right? But, but um, you're, we're able to bring their sugar and their uh, processed carbohydrates down so far Right, and do a little bit of intermittent fasting. They're that they're able to be ketogenic, and they love it. They love it. They lose weight. They feel great. Their inflammation goes down. So I don't think like ketogenic does not mean meat. And so I, you know, I think that um, you know, vegetarianism and veganism. I know you disagree with me, Kristen, because you went through. Yeah, you know, I even went through a year of veganism, which was terrible on my health. But we are helping people with these you know, um, uh, ways of eating, wh- whether it's right or wrong, and they're doing better by lowering their processed carbs and sugar, and they're doing better by intermittent fasting. And some of them along the way, it's funny, I had somebody in who was vegetarian, hated meat, had an aversion to meat. I said, in five months, I think you're going to be craving meat. Now she sends me pictures of steak and, and eggs and, you know, yeah. and bacon. So things change too. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not opposed. I'm definitely happy to work with patients who are vegan for whatever reason or vegetarian. I think the well, the you could probably help been, them more because you've been there. I you could yeah, probably help yeah. them more. Five you know how to navigate that realm. You know? <laughs> right. I, I know what to look out for. I can tell them the path that that's, that's going to happen. But yeah. I think it's re- removing all the processed foods or the industrialized feed oils, and regardless of what you're eating, it's almost more important to focus on what you're not eating sometimes too. And that's the processed food that's going to hijack your hormones, make you more hungry, not get that satiety signal. It's, it's an uphill battle. Yeah, I can't agree more. Listen, uh, Dr. Steve Murphy, any parting words of wisdom, any you know, final, final thoughts to wrap us up? And then maybe you can tell us if a patient was interested or if somebody was interested in finding you, how they would do that. Great. Absolutely. So I'll tell you what I tell everyone when I do a periscope or or anything like that, right? Do your best and be good to each other, right? Get your sun, hydrate, right? And exercise if you can. Take a walk, right? Take a walk. Go for a walk or a hike, right? Maybe lift some weights. You don't need to go crazy, but you just have to move a little bit. That's all. How do people find you? So my medical practice is called Murphy Medical Associates. Our website is GreenwichDocs.com. But if you're afflicted or have issues with this current COVID outbreak, our team is at CoronaTestCT.com. That's CoronaTestCT.com. That's the website where people can register, go to one of our sites, get tested, get telemedicine care. Maybe you're in a zone where you don't have doctors that have expertise in coronavirus, right? Maybe you need laboratories or diagnostics. We're there for them at coronatestct.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Listen, team, thank you so much for having me. Tro, it is an honor. You are exceeding all expectations that I could have ever imagined. I am so proud of what you're doing, bringing Kristen here, bringing Brian there, creating real value in a very righteous purpose you are a success and i'm yeah proud. we've we've had good mentors brian's been an amazing mentor Kristen, uh, so happy to that they partnered up brian and Kristen, and uh, i've had amazing mentors on the way present company included guys thank, thank you, you so much for listening Kristen. any parting words of wisdom no this was great thank you for letting me co-host with you hopefully i Brian lets me uh, take over a little bit more in the future. I can do this again. Yeah, we can, we, you know, Brian, you know, he's, he's, I think he's got like, you know, his third screening colonoscopy or, you know, he's got like his, <laughs> I don't know, he's like, I don't know, well, who knows what he's doing now. Maybe watching Matlock or something. Brian, I love you. Just kidding. 
All right, guys. Listen, everybody, thank you so much, Steve, Kristen. It was Thanks, great for, to have you guys. Thanks for having me. Kristen, great to meet you. Thank, thank you. you. You too. Thank you. Take care.